Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Not only has the Manipur Assembly passed a resolution calling upon the central government to abrogate the Sioux Agreement with 24 kooky outfits, at the same time as passing a second resolution calling for the implementation of the National Register of Citizens, but simultaneously and at the same time, the Manipur government has turned a deliberate blind eye to the Arambai Tengal, as well as the United National Liberation Front. Both outfits seem to have taken the law into their hands. They are clearly defying the police, and they seem to be threatening the state. And that raises the critical question, how do the cookies in Manipur view these developments? Joining me now is the well-known and highly regarded cookie politician, BJP MLA, Pawin Lal Haukip. Mr. Haukip, the Manipur Assembly has passed a resolution calling upon the central government to completely abrogate the Sioux Pact with Kuki Zo militant groups. It wants this done in the interest of ensuring peace and security in the region. Tell me, as a member of the Assembly and also as a member of the BJP, how do you respond to this? Well, Karen, uh, <clears throat> the SOO agreement, Suspension of Operations Agreement, uh, with the uh, various underground outfits belonging to the Kuki community was aimed at uh, bringing about peace in the land. And under that agreement, the arms and ammunition of the uh, outfits were, under, were placed under double lock and key. Uh, one key being held by the government. Now, on the other hand, you have uh, the Arambai Tengal and the UNLF Palm Bay Group, uh, looting state armories and brandis brandishing those arms openly in the valley, uh, which, uh, which is more conducive to peace. The continuation of an agreement wherein insurgents are required to place their arms under lock and key or an agreement where the government turns a Nelson's eye to the open looting of arms and the open brandishing of arms and weapons in the valley. Let's first focus on the resolution passed by the Manipur Assembly wanting the abrogation of the Sioux agreements. I'll come to Arambai Tengal and UNLF after that. That would be easier for an audience outside Manipur to follow our argument. Am I right in believing that you therefore disagree with what the Manipur Assembly has done. You do not endorse and support the resolution calling for the abrogation of the Sioux Pact. Well, uh, current, uh, if you ask my personal opinion, uh, I am for it because the state government has uh, lost its moral authority to be a part of that Sioux Agreement. So if you ask me, a new agreement should be entered into by the uh, uh, KNO UPF and the central government without the state being part of it. Okay, so you're not actually calling for 
abrogation. You're calling for a new agreement new between the central government and the 24 kooky outfits without the state government being involved. Yes, that is the way forward because uh, now that uh, the state has practically uh, lost its moral authority uh, to have any say on the cookie territories. And because of the communal nature of the government, they should not be a part of the negotiations anymore. In other words, the state, by which you mean the state government of Biren Singh, has yes. lost credibility. Exactly, Karan. Now, in a message on X, Shortly after the resolution was passed by the Manipur Assembly, Chief Minister Biren Singh claimed that the resolution was passed unanimously. Given that all the 10 Kuki Zo MLAs did not participate because they were not present in the Assembly, is he right to call this unanimous? It is right for the remnants of Manipur because they no longer count the 10 Kuki MLAs as part of Manipur. That is the only way in which they can call such a resolution unanimous. They cannot provide security to le elected legislative members to attend the assembly. And in their absence, they conveniently passed what they called a unanimous resolution. So uh, in a tragic yet uh, comical sense, it is unanimous for the, that part of Manipur, yes. So what you're saying is that in calling a resolution passed without even the presence and participation of the 10 Kuki Zo MLAs unanimous, what the Chief Minister in effect is doing is discarding and doing away with those 10 Kuki MLAs. He's in effect accepting that they are no longer part of Manipur. That is what is implied. And so is the resolution uh, for the abrogation of SO, because uh, in a way, he is freeing himself from uh, any 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 uh, decision that is going to be taken by the center. He is okay. trying to justify himself. How did the 10 Naga MLAs vote? I presume that they were present in the assembly, and I presume that they voted in favor. Otherwise, the chief minister could not have claimed unanimity. Am I right in both presumptions? Well, Karan, uh, as far as the uh, 10 Naga MLAs are concerned, they're still in the valley. And whoever is in the valley is under threat. And as you might recall, whoever raises a sane voice, be it uh, the respected uh, human rights activist Bablu Loitongbam, be it uh, Brinda, they have been either brindalized or uh, bablut by the Arambai Chengong. But are you suggesting that the 10 Naga MLAs, who I presume voted in favor of the resolution to abrogate the Sioux agreements, did so under some sort of compulsion? Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, first of all, I don't think there was any voting. and uh, But uh, the fact that they failed to protest would... Uh, I mean, would mean that uh, they agreed, agreed to the resolution. Uh, but like I said, they could not have possibly opposed such a resolution uh, living in Infa. You're saying they agreed in quotations because they could not have opposed it because they're living in Imphal. And that means they would come under the influence and pressure of the Maite, which is the majority in Imphal. Is that what you're saying? Uh, not the Maite per se, Karan. There is a radicalized group uh, patronized by the chief minister. And uh, even the state legislators have been made to take an oath before the Arambai Tengo. So in other words, the Naga MLAs, if they voted in favor, and you presume they did, would have done so under pressure from the Arambai Tengon? Not a direct pressure as such, Karan, but... What sort of pressure then? I mean, if the Arambai Tengol can take on uh, people like Bablu, people like uh, Brinda, uh, what would prevent them from attacking uh, any uh, legislator who dare propose or oppose, rather mm -hmm. oppose a resolution that was 
dictated by the Arambai Tiangol. That resolution was uh, dictated by Arambai Tiangol at Kangla Fort. Let me ask you this. Have differences emerged between the Kuki community on the one side and the Naga community on the other, particularly over this resolution, which it seems the Naga MLAs, for whichever reason, supported. Have differences begun to emerge between the Kuki and the Naga? Not at all, Karen. Uh, we understand the situation they are in. And like I said, it was not a voted resolution. It was a bulldoze resolution under the diktat of uh, Rambai Tiangol, which has assumed uh, you know, the right to exercise force over the state, uh, the right to use physical force is the prerogative of the state, but the state today in Imphal has apparently surrendered that right to Arambai Tengol. I'll come to Arambai Tengol in a moment's time because that will certainly be a major part of our interview, as I indicated in my introduction. But one more question about the resolution calling for the abrogation of the Sioux agreements with the Kuki militants. You and the other nine Kuki MLAs issued a press release shortly after the resolution was passed. And you pointed out in that press release that a joint monitoring group exists to oversee the agreement. And you then asked a specific question, which I want to put to you. You said, we would like to question whether the resolution adopted by the August House was passed on any report or observations of the JMG, which is the only official mechanism to determine whether any violation of the ground rules has taken place or not. Was there any indication from the JMG that the ground rules that determined the Sioux Agreement were being violated by the Kuki militants? I have to point out to you, and the audience will know this, that this has been alleged by Maite groups since May. And the Maite groups have been claiming that the Kuki militants who surrendered their weapons have somehow got access back to them and that the ground rules have been violated. So what is the answer to your question which you raised in that press release? I mean, uh, the monitoring has been going on and the uh, monitoring reports have always suggested that there has been no violation, that the cadres are in the camp, that the arms are under log and key. Now, when such a genocidal war is thrust upon you, as a community, people tend to arm themselves. Now, to presume, like the Meites, some of the Meites did, that all the arms that were used in the defense of villages necessarily comes from those games is a fallacy and the whole problem in Manipur is because of uh, false trajectories, false narratives, falsehoods. But you're saying to me Mr. Haukip that the Kuki militant groups, there are 24 of them, have observed the Sioux pact, that they have not breached it that they have not acquired access to their weapons in any shape and form. You're saying they have honorably observed the pact. That is what the joint JMG reports have reported. Those are on record. In other words, the government and the Manipur Assembly have no grounds whatsoever for demanding the abrogation of the pacts. The grounds that they are creating is, again, built on a narrative of falsehood, Karan. And since the beginning of this conflict, uh, you see the kind of propaganda and false narratives that are being projected to justify something wrong. And that the moment we dare to face the truth, the crisis will begin to end. Let me at this point, Mr. Haukip, come to a second resolution passed by the Manipur Assembly in the last few days. This time, the Assembly reaffirmed an earlier resolution of 2022 calling for the implementation of the National Register of Citizens. How do you respond to that? Karan, uh, if we have 
a neutral government, a fair government in place, there is no objection whatsoever of conducting an NRC. But as you can see, a year before the uh, troubles began, when you have the head of government, uh, you know, piloting a smear campaign against a particular, particular community, would you trust such a government Given the, its false narrative of illegal immigration, given its false narrative of attributing uh, the drug business to one particular community, would you trust such a government to conduct a fair national register of uh, register of citizens exercise? You're saying I to would... me, you're saying to me that Biran Singh cannot be trusted to conduct a fair national register of citizens exercise. Not at all. Not at all. He's gone on record on X to say NRC is crucial for safeguarding the interests of our state and contributing to the greater good of our nation. As one of his MLAs, how do you respond to that? Well, if the central government were to conduct the exercise in all fairness, I for one welcome such a step. But if the state government conducts it, you're against it. I cannot support such a communal government to conduct such a sensitive exercise. So in other words, your position is if the central government conducts the National Register of Citizens, you would be in favor of the exercise. But if it's left to Biren Singh and his government, you are opposed to it. Exactly, Karan. Exactly. Now, the paradox, Mr. Hauke, is that whilst the Biren Singh government is pushing to scrap the SOO agreements, it's aligned the Arambai Tengol to become a law unto itself, and it allows Arambai Tengol to defy the police. A recent statement by the Manipur police accused the Tengol of many anti-social activities, such as assaulting civilians and snatching vehicles. The police have also gone on record to say that the Tengol is involved in extortion. And late last month, the Tengol abducted an additional superintendent of police because its SECMI unit chief, a gentleman called Robin M, was arrested for allegedly snatching a vehicle from a petrol pump. How do you respond to the way the Mbiren Singh government has allowed the Arambai Tengol to become a law unto themselves, to defy the police and to threaten the state? Karan, uh... I saw your interview with, uh, with a respected uh, uh, journalist, Pradeep Pan Panjobam, and uh, you asked for his reaction on the same topic. Uh, it is unfortunate that uh, he could not speak his free mind because we need to understand them. Uh, on my per personal reaction, I would say this. The Arambai Tengol has been created to preserve uh, the CM position for Mr. Biren Singh. He is using that to threaten the center that if he's removed, there will be bloodshed in Manipur. And unfortunately, uh, the center seems to be buy buying that. I mean, giving into that threat. All you need, Karen, to restore uh, some semblance of peace, the end of violence in Manipur, is to reintroduce the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, give the army the full powers to disarm civilian militias on both sides. That is the end of violence. But you said something very important, Mr. Haukip, and I'm interrupting you on purpose because I think I'd like you to clarify it or maybe even expand on it. You said Arambai Tengol has been created to preserve the chief minister's position for Biren Singh. And you also said he uses the Arambai Tengol to threaten the center that if he's removed, there will be chaos and mayhem. In other words, you're saying Arambai Tengol has been created by, it is a creation of Biren Singh. 
Yes, it has been clear from the beginning. It is a creation by Mr. Biren Singh and Laisimba Sana Zauba, the Raisaba Maharaja, uh, the Raisaba MP. In other words, it is a creature and it does what the chief minister wants it to do. Arambai Tengal carries out the chief minister's orders. Yes, Karana. How do you explain all the legislators of a state, you know, gathered in a, in a, in a place at Kangla Fort and made to take oaths before a civil militia? Where is the chief minister? Where is the government there? Where is the state force there? Have you, in your long span of journalism, Karan, ever witnessed such such a uh, desecration of the state's authority? You're referring to what happened on the 21st, 22nd, then about of January, when 37 MLAs and two MPs, all Maite, were required, if not forced, to take an oath to express their affiliation to the objectives and principles of the Ram by Tengal. They also had to sign a document. The chief minister wasn't present at Kangla Fort to take the oath, but he certainly signed that document. Does that mean that today the Ram by Tengal is more important than the state government? That is what is turning out to be. The chief minister was uh, not present because if it were somebody else, the Tengal would have taken stern action on him. But because it is his militia, he can afford to be absent. Because it was his agenda, anybody who raises a sand voice against such, such activity was slapped around. You know, how can a state allow its legislators to be assembled under duress, take an oath, other than the one under the constitution and which contradicts the order under the constitution and allowed to be slapped around by a, a militia like that. It is let such a put, disgrace. Let me put to you, Mr. Haukip, a question that the audience will be asking themselves at this point. They'll say to themselves, Paulinar Haukip is an MLA, a member of the assembly. More importantly, Paulin R. Haukip is a member of the BJP, which means Biren Singh is his party leader. And yet here he is saying that the Arambai Tengal is more important than the state government. Karan, what I'm saying is the truth. It is true that I'm a BJP MLA, but unfortunately in Manipur, the party has been appropriated for a particular ethnic group, whereas my allegiance to the party at the center remains intact, my suggestions before the troubles to the state president on uh, preventing such a crisis were ignored completely. And uh, the party has been misappropriated. Let me at this point quote to you what a police officer told the Hindu about the Arambai Tengal. He said, our hands are tied. We are stopped from taking action against the miscreants. In other words, orders he is suggesting have been given by the state government and presumably by Biren Singh himself to the police, do not take action against the Arambai Tengal. Exactly. That's what, that, that's what has been happening and it is very demoralizing for the state forces. And there, there have been ample instances where Arambai Tengal uh, personnel has been injected into the uh, state commando units. It was proven in More. You're saying Arambai Tengal personnel have now infiltrated and have been deliberately brought in to state militia units. They have been embedded. The, 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 the state commando, uh, I mean, the Arambai Tengal personnel have been embedded in several instances uh, alongside the state commando units. And has this been done by Biren Singh? Nobody would have dared to do such a thing without his authority, Karan.
Does this explain why the Arambai Thengol had the capacity and the audacity to abduct an additional superintendent of police and physically beat him up? Precisely, precisely. So in other words, the Arambai Thengol is really the government in Manipur. If you if you have read uh, that novel, Jekyll and Hyde, uh, Mr. Birain Singh is playing his Jekyll face when he uh, assumes authority over the state police. And uh, when he communicates with the Rambai Tengal, that is his Mr. Hyde side. But he is responsible as head of both. He both is the state government and he is also the effective authority in Amram by Tengol. Yes, and he must be tried and uh, prosecuted for the inhuman crimes that have followed, that have unfolded in Manipur. Mr. Hapkip, a second worrying development concerns the United National Liberation Front, a previously underground Maite extremist militia group, which has now, as a result of a peace treaty signed in November with the central government, come over ground. It was intended when that peace treaty was signed that the UNLF would be kept in camps and monitored by central agencies, just as the Sioux groups under the Kuki arrangement are also kept in camps. But the Hindu says that the UNLF are roaming around in vehicles, brandishing weapons, indulging in violence against security forces, and even looting police armories. Again, is this being done with the permission and with the knowledge of the chief minister? Is he once again complicit? Otherwise, how can that ever happen, Karan? If the state were to deliver on its responsibility, uh, there is no scope for, you know, militants to roam about like that openly, brandishing automatic weapons. Now, uh, since you mentioned that, if you look at the uh, the narratives built on the uh, SOO groups uh, taking part in the uh, defense of villages, there are no videos. Uh, it is... All the videos that have come out from the cookie side are videos of village volunteers. Now, if you look at the videos that have emerged from Imphal Valley, it is the MPLA, uh, that is the UNLF, MPA, Manipur People's Army. Uh, th those are cadres of the UNLF. They have been brandishing all very sophisticated weapons in huge numbers, in huge quantities, and there were videos of them openly branding, brandishing those weapons and running by the chief minister's bungalow. Running past the chief minister's bungalow with all the security personnel just uh, acting as spectators. You're saying to me that not only is the chief minister aware of how the UNLF are behaving, brandishing weapons, looting, armories, physically assaulting security personnel, He's happy for them to do so. He's not just aware they're doing it. He's happy for them to do so. And in effect, you're saying they're doing it with his connivance or permission. Like I said, I will not say it is with his connivance, but I'll say this. If he were to act as a chief minister suit, such things should never happen and could never happen. He's, in other words, allowing them to happen. Yes. Which means he's happy for them to happen. Obviously, logic follows. Again, listening to the second part of our interview, the audience will have got the following thought in their head, and I want to put it to you. The audience will say that it seems Mr. Biren Singh has two aims. Firstly, to scupper the Sioux Agreement, which would upset the Kukizo community. And secondly, to give a free hand to Arambai Tengal and the UNLF, which would please the Maite community. If that thought is occurring to the audience, how would you respond to it? 
Well, uh, as far as the uh, cookie Joe community are concerned, uh, Karen, uh, they would rather that the SOO is abrogated so that the SOO cadres can join in freely like the UNLF cadres did in defending our land and our homes and our hearts. Uh, that is the sentiment the people has begun to feel. The Kukizo people has begun to feel. Well, there is an ethnic cleansing war being waged on us by radical Maitai supported by the state. Our Sioux cadres are held in camps and their, their, their arms and munitions are kept under lock and key, which they feel is very unfair. Tell me something. Something has emerged very clearly right through this interview. You do not trust Biren Singh. At one point, you said his government has no credibility. You have deep differences with him, but equally deep differences also with other Maite MLAs who are members of the BJP. They are your party men because they are part of the BJP, but you have deep differences with them. Why no, have you not me... resigned from the BJP? Let me correct you there. There are very sensible Maitai legislators who do not want this to happen. But the moment they raise their voice against uh, Mr. Birain, they are threatened. They have been terrorized. And uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Ragumani, uh, when he raised some sensible uh, voices, uh, against Mr. Birain when he demanded that the CBI or the central agency should uh, investigate into uh, the seizure of a huge quantity of drugs uh, in Delhi, which belongs to the uh, Itocha syndicate. Uh, his house was raided, his son was trussed, and he was warned. Now, under the such an, uh, a political environment, most of the uh, sensible legislators are also keeping quiet. They are not supportive of the agenda. You're saying that Biren Singh is also intimidating Maite MLS. Exactly. So Look Biren point. Singh is the key problem in Manipur. Beg your pardon? Is Biren Singh the key problem in Manipur? He has been and he will continue to be, Karan. Have unless, you unless have you shared your thoughts no. with people like Amit Shah and Narendra Modi? I beg your pardon, Karan? Have you shared your thoughts with people like Amit Shah and Narendra Modi? The Honorable Prime Minister, unfortunately, could not still find time for us, despite we seeking uh, an appointment with him. Uh, as far as the Home Minister is concerned, I have expressed my concerns to him once. Uh, we have met him. And what and was I, the response? What was the response? Uh, on that specific point, he did not respond, but uh, all he said was, uh, let's end the violence and then uh, talk about solution. But... The violence has been prolonged, as you know, by uh, Mr. Birin Singh and his Rambai Tengol. The you know, one, have... thing, one thing is very clear. The Prime Minister won't talk to you. You've tried, but he won't meet you. The Home Minister has spoken to you once at least. You've expressed your concerns, but he didn't respond. Why then do you continue to be part of the BJP? They are allowing someone you consider to be the key cause of the problem, Biren Singh, to continue as chief minister. Biren Singh is encouraging, promoting, practically, effectively running the Aram by Tengal. You said so yourself. Why then do you continue to be part of this government? Why do you continue to be part of this party? Karan, the party cannot be allowed to be appropriated by uh, people who are untruthful, people who are uh, a danger to the state, a danger to society. We have to fight to, to, to win back the party for the but people. But it's a losing fight at the moment. All battles might not be a winning battle, but uh, we have to keep fighting the good fight.
But Baren Singh looks deeply entrenched. No one's taking any effort or step to remove him. So what happens now? I think he's made. I think he's made to feel that way, and uh, a time will come. Reckoning will come. When will that be? I'm hopeful. I, I'm not a prophet. I cannot say when, but I'm hopeful that. In the meantime, the situation in Manipur is steadily getting worse. Yes, it is getting worse, and uh, the, the 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 worse it gets, uh, I think the nearer we are to a solution. That sounds philosophical. You're getting to rock bottom and you believe somewhere at rock bottom there will be a solution. Yes. All right. We'll end it there. But it does look to the audience as if this is a pretty hopeless situation in Manipur. It is hopeless, but the moment the central government, the Honorable Prime Minister and the Honorable Union Home Minister uh, wants to end it, it is not a difficult thing at all. Ah, uh -huh. now you're suggesting they are to blame. You say the moment the Prime Minister and the Honourable Home Minister want to end it, it won't take long at all. But they don't show any signs of wanting to end it, so they are to blame. I mean, uh, I would, uh, I would not uh, say they are to be blamed, but uh, for us as people who suffer, it's been a long time. But there are complexities involved. And which might have, uh, you know, uh, taken time for them to come to a conclusion. But I'm hopeful they soon come to some conclusion and take definitive action. Mr. Hakib, thank you very much for making time for me and for talking to me. Take thank care. You. Stay safe. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.